to our latest podcast. Today we're chatting with Sam Parker Davies, who's really into making things better through regenerative design. He got inspired by helping out his grandmother on her farm and working on cool projects. Now he's traveling the world, focusing on making land healthier with regenerative agroforestry and landscape restoration. Right now he's in the Middle East, working on fixing up dry lands and deserts. In Europe, he's helping out with solutions for the refugee crisis and teaming up with farmers to make a positive impact on the land. And next up, Sam's off to South America to learn about restoring forests. Join us and let Sam open our eyes to the amazing possibilities of regenerative design. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. And today we've got Sam Parker Davies. And Sam's actually normally all the way from Lismore and the Northern Rivers or the Shannon to be more accurate. But Sam's actually in Jordan in the Middle East at the moment. So, um, Sam, tell us a bit about yourself, mate, and how'd you end up in Jordan? All right. So, I grew up in the Blue Mountains, actually near the Sydney. And I grew up around the family that knew of permaculture and practiced it to an extent. My grandfather had started an eco village in the 80s before I was born. My grandmother had done her PDC in the 80s before I was born. She made permaculture gardens and her partner built houses. They did them up. I was on my mum's side. And on my dad's side, my grandfather had this eco village. I lived off grid. They all lived on solar, had cows and gardens. And so I I guess it was normalised to me from a young age, off-grid living. It was something that I... Um, knew it was possible um, and what I wasn't excited about because I was a little kid but as I grew up and I became more aware of envi- environmental issues I became very passionate about it very quick but more about the solutions bigger solutions for the world how do we solve big crises and how do we be part of, of an ethical planet how do we be part of uh, ethical humanity I wanted to be a a uh, person that lives solutions rather than a person that contributed to problems. Yeah. And so when I finished school, I went straight into studying permaculture. It was, it's the only career I've ever had. So <laughs> I've never had a full-time job outside of permaculture. It's the only thing I've, I've ever, I've ever pursued. And so I left, um, I left school. I went straight into it. I did my PDC. I started teaching homeschool children, my first business was teaching homeschool children how to build with mud. And that was my first apprenticeship, just, just on the edge of leaving school. I learned how to build with mud, learned um, how to do eco building. And then it wasn't enough, like just doing those sorts of things. I didn't feel like I, I was doing what I could be doing. I wasn't learning what I wanted to be learning. And I just started looking online and found this, um, this farm called Zaytuna Farm. And I thought, wow. That sounds incredible. It was this internship program that they were offering that involved large animals, small animals, food forests, vegetables, um, nurseries. It was like all the things I needed to to really learn how to grow my own food and be self-sufficient. So I said, yes, I want to do that. I applied, I got accepted, and I turned up to the farm that actually cancelled the, the internship on my way up there. And I just said, no, <laughs> I'm not leaving. Like, this. I'm <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, a, I've been a thorn in Jeff's side for about seven years now. Um, but one that just wouldn't leave. Cool. So it's been those at home that don't know. So Zaytuna Farm is Jeff Lawton, um, Jeff Lawton's farm. So, yeah. uh, well, it used to be Jeff Lawton's farm. It's very different these days. Zaytuna Farm and yeah. um, Zaytuna Eco Hamlet. So, there's a lot, lot to unpack in that story, which is pretty exciting. Mm. Uh, but it's interesting that, yeah, you've only ever done permaculture. It's funny. Um, Lennox is my son. He's eight. Mm. He has never ever – so we're into motorbikes, you know, sort of mad about. And um, he has never ridden a petrol motorbike, and he's pretty much grown up in electric cars. And he's like, Dad, I never want to ride or drive a petrol car in my life. I just want to do electric. So. <laughs> Cool. Um, and I, there's certain times like, Bud, do you want to go? He's like, nah. Uh, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I want to get a petrol bike. And it's like, nah, I'm sticking electric, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, interesting. You've only worked in permaculture. So, considering that, in you know, in the big scheme of things, like permaculture as a career really is since the late 70s, you know? So, um, it's not like it's a, a new big thing. So, um, awesome. So, mate, t- tell us a bit about, tell us a bit more about Zaytuna Farm. So, it's a it's an eco hamlet. Um, there's, yeah, t- tell us a bit more of the community there and how that community works. So for, from my point of view coming in, 
the the legal structure of Zaytuna Farm is it's it's an area that's shared. It's got eight shares owned by a company, which is a bit confusing, but it's owned by a company. And we, me, including Jeff, all the people that have bought into this farm now, um, own shares in this company, which entitle them to land use. So it's a creative way, creative legal structure, in which we've been able to set up an uh, eco-village, an eco-farming hamlet, which my grandfather actually pioneered. My grandfather's farm was the first farm to set up this legal structure. So for me coming in, it's old news. For the rest of the yeah. people, it's very new. But for me, yeah. it's what my grandfather did, actually what my grandfather pioneered. And so for me coming in, I see Jeff's one, like Jeff Lawton's one, they do the farm. It's far more functional. <laughs> it's, it's learned on the back of these other ones that maybe have not worked so well, you know? Yeah. So my grandfather and his friends are beautiful people, but there's those problems and those difficulties to iron out in the first generation of, of figuring these things out. And Zaytuna Farm is the most advanced permaculture farm I've ever been to. And I've been to a lot. I've been to a lot in Australia. I've been to a lot outside of Australia. And it's not to say that there aren't other people doing incredible things, but I have not seen something so thoroughly thought through and so beautifully executed. There's food forests on Zaytuna Farm that will last for a long, 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 long time. It's been an education center for over 20 years. People from all over the world have come to learn how, not only how to live off grid, but how to regenerate the earth, how to be a person that contributes to the increasing abundance of planet earth, rather than destroying the earth's resources, making sure we have more water, more food, more soil than we had before making sure that we have more life potential, more opportunities to live. And this, for me, underpins why I became a permaculturalist. The off-grid thing and living a life that I love was actually just a benefit. It was just an yeah. extra thing. So, so tell us more. So what does off-grid mean to you? Like, what is a living? Because I know it's like, like recently the girls have said, Mike, you get better at social media and, you know, because I'm just not into it. Um, make an effort, get on these Facebook groups and see things. I've got people watching people ask a question and say, you know, I've got um, my solar system, but I still buy gas and I still buy petrol. Like, am I off grid? You know, <laughs> it's the same. So um, and it's a very controversial topic. So, and I, it's funny because I'm the off grid guy. I'm off grid. I'm just connected to the grid, which is a whole other story. <laughs> and <laughs> I encourage people to stay connected to the grid. So uh, on a whole bigger picture, you know, so, um, but yeah. So what does off grid mean to you? So it's actually a hard thing to say because I feel like we set all these words like they're like it's about the like it's about the goal, it's about the end game rather than about the journey to get there. And there's there's nothing in life that's actually that actually is that. If we pri yeah. prioritize the the goal more than the journey, we, we can never take the steps to end up there. And yeah. I think off grid as a concept, uh, what I imagine it to be is just off the electrical grid. But I know there's layers of meaning to that that's more. So for me, it's an ever-evolving process of how do I be the best human being I can possibly be? Yeah. How do I be someone who contributes to the health of the earth in the greatest possible way that I can? Because I think the connotations of off-grid can also mean doing without, not yeah. being with something. But the way I like to term the way I live is it's actually increasing my resources. As yep. a permaculturalist, I'm increasing my natural resources. So I'm living with more than most people. Most people don't have a forest of food that grows itself and replicates itself and has trees in it that are about 20 years old. Most people yep. don't have that. I'm richer in resources rather than without resources, which is something I want to I want to change in the psychology of people when they when they partner with nature. Their resources expand and grow. They don't diminish. They're not off something or without something. Yeah. They're increased in something. They have more. So what I see as off grid is it's acknowledging I don't need to be babied. I don't need to have someone bigger than me telling me or giving me my electricity, giving me my food, giving me my water because I'm a baby that can't do it myself. Being off grid is a, a a claim for independence. It's a claim for autonomy. It's saying, no, I'm a capable human being 
and I can achieve this, I can do this. I can meet my own needs. I can grow my own food. I can supply myself with energy. I can build the skills and be the person that will meet my own needs. Yeah. In my context, I do that as part of a community. So even more beautifully, I am in a process of being someone that relies on the people around me. I know the names of the people that help me meet my needs, that we supply one another. I would love yeah. one day to be sitting in front of you in, in clothes that were made by someone I know, not by someone in Bangladesh, you know, yeah. not by someone yeah. where I don't know their name. I never met them in my life. I've got this idea. I'm better than the times of slavery, but in the times of slavery, they knew their slaves' names. I don't know my slave's name, you know? Yeah. I'm sitting here wearing the clothes that he made and I don't know who they are. And so bit by bit, step by step, I don't expect myself ever to make clothes, but I'd at least like to have a relationship with the person who made my shirt. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. It's, um, yeah, it's that I've, we've started a new division here at work and, um, you know, saving businesses money. And we've got an energy vision basically for businesses, yeah. um, help them buy as much renewable energy from the grid of a day, basically, which is of course, renewables is the cheapest form of energy. So they're going to save money, you know? So, um, it's, yeah, it's what I've learned going out to speaking to new business owners and everyone It's just like, most of the people talk, they don't really care about saving money. It's like, Mike, you're a local business here in the Northern rivers. We want to support you, you know? Mm. Um, so it's really good to see that out in the community that a lot of people, it's not really about the money. There's like, if I sort of pay that amount of energy, great. But if I'm that money's going to yes. a local business and someone I know, I'd rather support them, you know. So, which yeah. is good, and uh, to, and especially after the floods, you know, like Lismore's been a real, yeah, broken town. is probably the best way to describe it. So yes. I think that community is so important. Um, so, but yeah, so it is. It's 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 one of those things. I see a lot of customers, and I I really would encourage people to get involved in the community and spend some time in the community, but. I've had a few customers over the years where they've purchased a big block of land, they've gone off grid um, yes. and sold it because it was just way too much work for one individual or a family or uh, to do. And so, mate, tell us a few more benefits of what you think of being involved in that community has helped you out with there. So, and a recommendation sure. if someone was going to get in the community, what would what do you recommend they do before buying in the community, getting involved in the community? Some some tips before doing it. 100% the best thing about living at Zaytuna is that it's well designed. So there's been thought and consideration from someone who's done it before, put into it. And I would not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy into a community where it hasn't had a permaculture design done um, yeah. in the beginning processes of that community. I just would not. And I'd want it done by a permaculture designer I trust that has credibility. I wouldn't just be going into, well, okay, cool. We're all going to live on this block of land together. We're all going to do these things together because fundamental resources that whole nations have wars about. Whole nations fight about fuel. They fight about water. They fight about food. They fight about land use areas. It's the, the, it's the thing that's caused war since the dawn of time. And somehow we think that we're above that as, an, as individual humans, that we're just going to settle on a piece of land and not fight about those things is delusional. Yeah, it's, it's just not true. It's ignoring tens of thousands of years of history and pretending that we're immune to it. That it just won't happen to us. And it's just not true. Yeah. Having totally. a good design is essential. Absolutely essential. Having something well thought out and well understood, anchored in ethics, which is what permaculture design is. If we don't anchor ourselves in ethical design in order to set up a piece of land, I don't think we can be truly happy living on a um, on a community together i just don't think it can, can be done in a in an intelligent way and so that's that's for me if I, if I was going to give anyone any advice it's seek out a good permaculture designer before you establish your place and get them to design the place work with them work with them to design your land and get it functional get it set up and then invite the people on and many people do this for profit well, I can do this for profit. That's the, the way Jeff did it very intelligently. He, he it was an um, education center. He, he kind of ran his business model off educating people and making sure that people learned. Gave a lot away for free, but it's how it supported himself getting through the things that needed to be gotten through to get it set up. 
took a long time, over 20 years for him to get to the stage yeah. he could. And we could do it in six months now. And yeah. then by the time we got to the stage that he got to, where he could sell, he sold and those plots made him money. He didn't sell in a greedy way. He didn't charge people ridiculous amounts, but it got him to a comfortable situation where he could develop his site and he could build his home. It was smart. Yeah. And there's no reason why people can't do that for profit. There's no yep. reason why that shouldn't be the new model of property development. Totally. Yeah. We talk about that property development path as something that, you know, you and I have talked, you know, about this before, but um, yeah, there's, it's, I've been involved in a couple of traditional property developments and it's crazy mm -hmm. of what goes on and, you know, how they think about things. And yeah. we, we run some numbers on a, on a project down the mid North coast. And what we worked out is that, Instead of putting eight houses on there, we worked out that we could put six on there. Mm -hmm. And just by putting six on, says so less houses, the six people become more self-sufficient. Um, mm -hmm. We designed that they could be... Our whole intention with the project was that as a minimum nine months a year, they'll be self-sufficient for energy and water. Yeah. And yeah. there was enough place for food. And it was actually really good because um, there was a lot of land down the back that was flood. You know, very rarely did it flood, you know, like mm -hmm. once in 100 years sort of flood type land. Um, but yeah, we run the numbers and we worked out that we could design, build these properties, make them more sustainable out of hemp or rammed earth or straw bale. Um, and that over a 10 year period, the people buying the houses, we could charge enough money up front that they would save enough from the energy savings, the water savings. Um, we didn't even take food into consideration because the reality is you take food, like what you can pay for a bag of carrots at a shop compared to growing your own. I know there's so much difference, but you can buy a bag of carrots for $2. We didn't take the food into consideration. But what we'd worked out in that project to build a proper, truly sustainable, more eco-friendly um, property development that, um, you know, that the, they'd be in after 10 years, it'd be worth them paying the extra money if that makes sense. And we would have made the same money of doing six properties as to eight because most property developers want to smaller houses, more properties on there because that's how they make their money. So um and it's things like what, what we did with the design. We, we had a natural swimming pool, um, which is low energy, um, but also the design was made around the natural swimming pool that the community could gather. And made that was literally six townhouses side by side, just made more sustainable, uh, overlooked a natural pool. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool, fun design. And um, we're just waiting to see what happens with that block of land or whether we purchase it or go ahead with it. So, um, but it's definitely, there's I think there's a, you know, even internet was another thing that we used and that there was just thinking of the things we did. Um, I see so many people in townhouses have, everyone has a Starlink connection. That's $140 everyone's paying where really you have one Starlink and share it between six people, you know? Mm. Um, so things like that can really help people reduce costs and it's more the fact of trust and people communicating with each other and working as a team to, to yeah, make it happen. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so find um, that benefit and ecological benefit. I just speak to what you said, Mike, because I've been exploring similar realm. I've, I've been so a lot of my background is in rural development. Like I, I've mainly just just done a lot of a lot of farm scale stuff, and um, I'm kind of I'm in a new phase where I living in the Middle East. It's a lot of built up area, not a lot of built up area, yeah. and so currently I'm in Jordan. And but I've been working with people in Saudi Arabia recently, and because they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff in Saudi, they're building new cities, they're pouring money into all sorts of new things. That they're, they're trying to do the the most ecological cities, the most this, the most that, the biggest. The, they're, they're pretty much just the new America, you know, the biggest, the yeah. best, the fastest. The that's what they what they're going for. And the the Saudis, they've got this um, this really open niche that they're inviting people to come into step into that they don't have the right designers to be able to do and so i've been doing these designs for for people in saudi where i can naturally cool their houses i can um, grow all their food from their wastewater so it's no extra water bill for them no extra water yeah. required and the money that would be required and the water that would be required to grow their lawn because everyone in Saudi grows lawns, they yeah. have like, English flowers and stuff that they need ridiculous <laughs> amounts of water for. So I'd completely yeah. save them their water bill. I'd save the money, 
every, every day, every week, every month, just on their water, just on their water. And the, the money that they would normally pay a Bengali or Indian worker to grow their lawn for them, I pay them to grow vegetables instead. So, it can yeah. be gorgeous, make it really, really beautiful, still landscape it, lots of trees, lots of shade, like a beautiful forest sort of feeling with nice ground covers and lots of food. And it means that not only is it cheaper for them to do that, but they have the added convenience of there's a basket of vegetables at their back doorstep every morning. They don't even yep. need the order it online. It just turns <laughs> out. <laughs> totally. So, uh, th th this sort of concept for me, I'm getting really excited about it because I haven't met people like, like Saudis were Bedouins one generation or two generations ago. You know, they, they were people living yeah. in the desert with, with sheep generally and living a very simple, very traditional, very indigenous lifestyle. All of a sudden with, with extreme wealth, they're completely left behind. It's phenomenal. Yeah. It's a very interesting case study. And in that event, they, they've disconnected with nature like that really, really yeah. fast. And I haven't, I haven't met a people I've, because the, the people we're working with at the moment, that they've got extreme wealth and even like the middle class is a lot wealthier than, than, um, than even the, the, like the upper middle class or the very high middle class of Australia. Yeah. And these, these people, they, they have a, they have a um, standard for their luxury which when I, when I think about it, when they're squeamishness, they're, they're scared of these germs and scared of those germs. And um, coming from rural Australia, it's a bit strange, but it's something where using logic and science, I'm able to go, look, for a chemical pool, if I've got a chlorine pool and I pee in the chlorine pool, you've got a kid, didn't wash their bum properly, peed in the pool, you pull it out, put a little bit more chlorine in it, that pee, that poo, those dead insects, the algae and stuff, they're still there. It's still there. Yeah. It's just got a chemical cocktail in it now as well. It's just got chlorine in it as well. In a natural swimming pool, that actually gets cleaned. That actually gets filtered out. Yeah. The plants actually extract that nutrient and that leaves the water. So I was like, I'm kind of like able to, to explain some illusions they've got. Like you've got this illusion that, that the chemical lifestyle you've got is clean. Yeah. But it's actually really dirty. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually yeah. really gross. Yeah. And this plant filter is far cleaner than this system that you've already got. So I'm sure you can agree with me, but having clean water to swim in, not only you're not going to get those skin rashes anymore, not only are you going to be able to open your eyes underwater or those sorts of things, but you're actually going to be swimming in clean water, right? like yep. actual clean water. Yeah, oh, mate. Yeah, Nadia's caught us a few times in the camera at her place. We um, The kids love that that swim. We got there like, yeah. You know, some will say, oh, Mike, can you come look at this or something on the side? So I'm like, yeah, kids, let's go. And they're like in the pool in the natural swimming pool. You yeah. know, it is one thing the kids are like, dad, 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 I can open my eyes in the pool and it doesn't hurt, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and we don't need our goggles, you know? So we're all the other pools like goggles, 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 you know? Yeah. So, um, no, it's, it's definitely true. So, I mean, so tell us a bit about natural swimming. That's actually a huge, yeah, like, uh, it's a huge subject is, is a rally. Like, um, yeah, a lot of people are really interested in doing natural swim. I've been contacted recently by quite a few people. So um, tell us a bit more how they work and because I know you've designed and implemented a few now. Yeah. So so um, natural swimming pools are cleaned by plants. Plants live off nutrient. Everyone knows that. And the way people are starting to grow plants, uh, so, so a revelation that someone had was, they could put nutrients in water and feed it directly to the plant. So it's how chemical agriculture works. It's how hydroponics work is they put nutrients in water and they feed it directly to the plant roots and the plants don't need to grow in any soil media. They just grow in rocks. And while that's a very disturbing idea when it comes to food, because it's got very limited nutrient when it comes like that, you're, you're creating sick plants, which will create sick people. Um, when done in the context of organic nutrient in a pool, you've actually got um, the same logic, the same idea is actually cleaning your pool. It's extracting all the nutrient from your pool that creates algae that makes your pool dirty in any way, shape or form. 
So by having beautiful flowering plants, by having a gorgeous flower garden, by having really beautiful flowers, really beautiful aquatic plants, whatever you want, any sort of aquatic plant you want to do, whatever colors you want to arrange, whatever sort of beautiful arrangement you want to create, you can have a filter, a natural filter, that pulls the nutrient out of your water, that pulls the nitrogen, pulls the phosphorus, pulls all the bits and pieces that we don't want in water at all. We want pure, crystal clean water. That's what the plants will give us. And that's naturally how water has been filtered since the beginning of time. Yeah. When water goes through a river, if it's a healthy river, we should be able to drink from that river if it's covered in plants. Yeah. Yeah. If it's not covered in plants, which is most rivers today, it's not safe to drink. And that's the same yeah. with our pools. If our pools don't have plants in them, and we should think like this, if our pools do not have plants in them, they're not safe to swim in. Yeah. We're going to get eye irritations. We're going to get lung problems, skin problems, just from the chlorine. If it doesn't have the chlorine, then it's going to be green and murky. And we're just going to know from the, from the beginning, we don't trust that. That's got nutrients yeah. in it. I don't want to swim in. Plus chlorine. No way. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, no, if there aren't plants in water, we shouldn't be swimming in that water. Yeah. And the other thing that I care about, you know, mainly for me, is that it's energy efficient. They use nothing, you know. They, they yeah. use um, pumps that can run fish tanks, you know. So yeah. I remember Jeff saying, Mike Hayden, it's 35 watts. That's all it's going to do. <laughs> and it's true. Like he, he's turned everything off on his system. Like he's, you know, turn all the power off. Nadi, the internet is gone. He's like, just run that full pump to see how much energy you use. And so, yeah, 35 watts. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're so yeah, energy yeah, efficient. Incredible. And the other thing as well, like, incredible. literally today, I was talking to a, someone, a potential person looking to buy solar and batteries. And it was all because they're putting a pool in. And um, it's crazy. It's like, well, we're going to spend 50, 60 grand on a the pool, then put solar and batteries in to try and save money on a pool. And it's just crazy and saying how you invest in all this infrastructure around a pool when literally you know a natural swimming pool it's better for you and you don't need to spend all that money on solar and batteries to have it energy efficient you know yeah there's a pool i looked at in italy and this this pool had like you know like a lot of big pools they've got a full pump house underneath it that pumps this water and then the the pump is using obscene amounts of energy like fifteen thousand watts sort of thing just to move the, the water around and the and that's just one pump and they've got a, a, like a cleaning pump that they have to switch on every couple of weeks to to clean it all automatically and then they've got um they've got a backup pump and then they've got the lights inside the pool they've, they've got all these, these other things going on where when, when i when i look at all that energy expenditure and i look at all that that stuff when i swim in that pool i'm still not satisfied like the, the, the pool while I was there, they've got this gym underground that looks into the pool through this window. And it was green for half the time I was there just because they missed putting chlorine yeah. in it for a couple of weeks. Or well, for a week, you know, just for, yeah. for a little period. And so then they had to pay these guys to come out and fix it. You know, they, they paid these guys to come out. And they were there for a day mucking around, putting chemicals in, switching the pump on and off and, and doing all this sort of stuff. And I look at the, the natural swimming pool we have here. We haven't touched it for a month, you know, and it's not green. There's, there's no problem. Like the maintenance hassle of, oh, I didn't put chlorine in it for a week and now I can't swim in it anymore because it's green and dirty. It's not there. <laughs> it's yeah. not an issue. It's not a thing. Yeah. It's that on so many fronts, I think natural swimming pools are just so much more superior than conventional pools insofar as your time and your energy, like just your personal yep. life, how much time you have to spend mucking around with chemicals. Then your health is another part of it. And then also that your, your money, the amount of money you're spending on getting professionals to come out and fix stuff. Yeah. Um, making sure that you've got the, you've got enough power, enough backup, the, the, either the bill you're paying or the, the bigger system that you need. <laughs> That's sort yep. of stuff to, to support totally. it. Yeah. There's I'm going to make his, there's just way yeah. too many pools for a conventional pool. Totally. I'm gonna mate, his job is he gets he goes and tests pool water like all day, yeah. every day. He runs around, tests pool water and maintains people's pools for him. You know, it's crazy. Just does like six to eight pools a day, driving around, testing the water, putting stuff in, just 
non-stop yeah. 365 days a year you know so yeah, yeah I, wonder it's, it's, I wonder if that if chlorine starts to accumulate in any of these organs or if there, there's some sort of um long-term thing on that because I, I know for painters they get stuff accumulates in their kidneys and often painters yeah. get kidney failure really yeah. normal and if yeah. you're messing around with a chemical that humans don't normally mess around with all day yeah. every day what that does to your body yeah, I think, Rob, it'll be either alcohol or chlorine that kills him, one of the two. So. <laughs> it'll just be bleeps. So. Yeah. Either which way, mate. He's, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, he'll be, yeah. It'll be one, one or the other, one or the other. So, yeah. um, mate, so on, on, on natural stuff with pools, and I know, so um, I've seen, you know, following you on Instagram, you've done a lot of work on, I've seen you some aquaculture stuff over, over in the Middle East. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so we've been mucking around with fish, which is quite quite fun to do in the Middle East because there's not much water. <laughs> so you've got to do some really novel and interesting things to make it work. So aquaculture, as far as fish goes, plants go, um, there's lots of things you can grow in water. It's not just fish. But it produces more grains, more protein than any land system you can imagine. And that for every hectare of cows, for every hectare of beef, there's going to be 30 hectares in protein production in water in just one yeah. hectare, what I'm saying. Yeah. So 30 times the amount of protein will be produced in water than what I can produce on land. Yeah. So for small scale food production systems, it's a no brainer. And the same goes for vegetables and plants. If I'm growing aquatic vegetables, I will grow 30 times the amount of vegetable production in water than I can grow on land. Yeah. It's obscene. It's actually ridiculous. And the nutrient and the water are already there. I don't need an irrigation system. And if I've got fish, they're already fertilizing my plants. So when we've done the, we've, we've, the things we've been doing in Iraq is we've been working for an aid company. So we've gone over for an aid organization, an NGO. I call them companies because they do, they just, they do do stuff for profit, even though they're not yeah. supposed to. They're, they're not the most ethical things in the world. So we've gone over helping these guys doing this thing with this organization. They take money from wealthy European nations. So they're called, yeah, they take money from a wealthy European nation and they're putting it into different places in Iraq. So we, we've devised this system where we, we have to help the local people get on their feet. How are they going to earn money? How are they going to create a livelihood? off of the small amount of money that we have to give each individual. So we've been yeah. playing with chicken systems, we've been playing with fish systems, we've been playing with tree systems, nurseries, and we, we've settled on some really good ones. So the fish is a, it's a total win. We can do them a, a pond, dig them a hole in the ground, put in a plastic liner, or if the soil's good, close the, close the soil with the bucket of the machine, and then fill it with water and put two different types of fish in, in the Iraqi system. And this is really simple aquaculture. You can put one type of fish, but <laughs> what's funny with just having one type of fish is that there's three layers of water. Well, there's three stratas that fish generally occupy. There'll be fish that feed off the bottom, fish that swim in the middle because of the current and because of the food that's provided, fish that eat off the top, and often vegetarian fish, fish that eat, up, eat off the top. And so these different layers, they, they can have three different types of fish that don't even know about each other, really. Don't even interact with one another. Yeah. And those three, three different types of fish, actually, because the fish eating off the bottom, they increase in size and they increase in number if there is more nutrient coming to where they are. So if there's fish above them pooing more, then there's going to be more of them. So by putting more fish in, you get an increase in those fish. So not only, so you've got one fish, not only by putting the second fish in do you then have more double the fish because you're growing another type of fish, but this amount of fish is more. This type of fish, there's more of this fish because you've introduced this other fish. Does that make sense? One fish, yep. two fish, blue fish, blue fish. <laughs> so with the with with that system, we, we, we've just done two for them, really simple. Could be a third one, could add, add in other stuff, but we've just put in two fish. We've put in common carp and silver carp. Silver carp eat, eat off the bottom, common carp actually eat off the top and the middle. And the next thing we could do, we could introduce grass carp. 
which would eat purely off the edges. That would be the third fish if we had it. But that's a Chinese carp. Yeah. So we, we grow the, these different fish in, in for them in Iraq, um, grow the plants on the area, on the edge for them, which actually for Syrian refugees, which is who we're working with, um, they actually eat a lot of water vegetables, surprisingly enough. This area of Syria, they come from an area that's right on the, the um, Tigris River. And the, and the area around there, they grow a lot of water vegetables, fresh water vegetables, and they're used to eating fresh water fish. They're not near the coast, don't eat saltwater fish, but they do have a culture where they make ponds or they, they grow fish in streams and those sorts of things. So there's a big, big demand for fresh water fish like carp. Carp is the most commonly eaten fish around the world. Most commonly eaten fish in Iraq by far. And it's delicious in Iraq. Really, really good. Carp is a really good fish. It gets yeah. really demonized in Australia. But yeah, I mean, my birthday, we used to go out towards Bathurst somewhere. We used to ride through the Blue Mountains. I can't remember the yeah. little town. They'd have the, the carp competitions where every year everyone would go catch all the carp and do the carp slaying competitions or whatever. I can't remember what they're called, but um, yeah. Is that but the it's a resource. Like, like, I know there's a there's an argument that carp have degraded our ecosystem and done done such horrible things in Australia. And I'd like to put it forward that carp are only there because the ecosystem has been degraded. It's actually happened the other way around. Yeah. Carp haven't degraded their our ecosystem. Our ecosystem has actually been degraded by humans. The trees got chopped off the sides of the rivers. The cows got grazed in the rivers. The whole area around the rivers. I'd like to put forward that it's actually the humans that have degraded the landscape, not the carp. And so that's why the carp have now come in um, and are taking up so much space in the waterways because the carp come from relatively degraded systems. Like if, if yeah. I'm growing fish in Iraq, I could be in the most degraded part of Iraq with the worst water in Iraq and I can still grow carp. Yeah. They come from, they're very resilient fish that grow in degraded ecosystems. They don't degrade ecosystems, they live in degraded ecosystems. People need to understand that. And if we're gonna come into a landscape that has for a long, long, long time, for millennia, been covered in trees, cut all the trees off, graze cows in it, and expect everything to stay the same health, we're delusional, we're nuts. Yeah. No, and then if so we're gonna blame the carp, we're gonna blame the carp. <laughs> <laughs> we're, nuts. we're crazy. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. I, I I'm gonna find out. Remember that name? I think it was a carp slaying competition or something like. Because it used to happen on my birthday, we'd go for a motorboat ride. My birthday in San little town, and um, it was always on every year at my birthday. And the town would just get packed of so many people. It's like a celebration for Mike, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, how awesome. So mate, you tell us a bit more. So you're um, you said before about so in Iraq there you're designing systems for people to make money, and yeah. so. You know, I know you're going to do some of this in your property here in Australia, and you're actually running a course in January. Is that right? Here in Australia, yeah, yeah. around this. So, so mate, yeah, to tell us a bit more about how in Australia here people could take advantage of these systems and use them because they, you know, and, and make some money from the land and how they could be more, use aquaculture based in their property more efficient. Well, in Australia, we have something very unique. We have the most diverse and the most unusual freshwater systems in the world. Because Australia is so flat, we have very weird rivers, rivers that most of the world doesn't have because they've got more slope to them, you know, but very unusual rivers. So our river systems have very bizarre freshwater creatures living inside them. We have the most species, the most, the greatest variety of freshwater crustaceans in the world. No one beats us. The Amazon doesn't beat us. We have more freshwater crustaceans than the Amazon, than anywhere yeah. else on the floor. And that gives us unique opportunities in so far as growing food that is novel and um, never been heard of before. Even in Australia, it's not on the market. And it's delicious. Yeah. We've, we've all, I'm sure most Australians have gone catching abbeys. Yeah, I've yeah. gone found yabbies, caught them, enjoyed that sort of that sort of thing. And maybe not as many Australians would have tasted the yabby, but they're pretty yum. They're quite delicious. They're freshwater lobster. And what's amazing about the yabby is that they grow very, very well. 
they love to proliferate themselves. So in, in the course that I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach people how they can make money from their farms, how they can do aquaculture systems and make, make good coin. But I'm also going to be teaching people how to set it all up. So from beginning to finish, we'll put in roads, we'll put in house pads, put in a nice sort of rice paddy where I'm going to grow lotus just for, for beauty and for food. And then I'm going to do a swale from my rice paddy. So when all my nutrient, when all my water floods up and my system floods, the nutrient from my rice paddy backs up and fertilizes my fruit trees. I'm going to grow fruit trees on a swale. So I'll have a rice paddy, swale, fruit tree system right next to my camping area, which is where I'm going to have everyone that comes to stay. I have a road just joining over the top of them, separated by a pipe, and I'm going to have a baffle plate, a metal plate in the ground with a pipe at the bottom so they can completely empty my paddy when I want to harvest, when I want to harvest my food. That nutrient will then flow into a canal. I have a canal that joins two dams beneath that. It's getting a bit wild here. It's, it's a bit of a crazy <laughs> But I've got these two dams underneath my rice paddy with a canal joining them, which is where I'm going to grow my yabbies. I'm going to grow my yabbies in an area where they've got deep water, where they can hide. And then when it's breeding season, they're going to go nuts all through the canal, all through um, shallow water, which is where I'm going to harvest them. It's much easier for me to harvest a yabby in shallow water than deep water. So I've made sure that they've got a genetic reserve that I can never over harvest them. So I always give them that dam. It's just populating, 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 go, go nuts, go crazy. Just grow as much as they want to grow. I'll never harvest from there. But when it's when it's breeding season and they grow and grow and grow and grow and go all the way through my canal, that's where I'm going to be aiming for. I'm going to be looking to, to get them out of that canal. Interesting. So that's how I'm looking to do my fish as well, actually. So yeah. if I if I start growing fish, and Australia is difficult to grow fish, to be honest. You, you have to create very unique systems to be able to grow fish because they they – the native fish of Australia, the, the fish we're legally allowed to grow. We've got carp and tilapia in Australia, but legally we're not allowed to grow them, which is a shame. But the, the native fish we can grow, they actually have a lot of reliance on tannin floods. So like the flood um, and drought system that we've got in the, the interior of Australia or salt water you know, because it, salt water goes really far up the rivers because we're so flat. Yeah. So they've got a really strange relationship with, salt water and tannins but there's one fish native to the northern rivers the catfish it breeds on a gravel bed with running water it's a very hard system to replicate but it's the one thing that you could muck around with quite a bit and try and replicate it and you could be growing catfish you could be growing eel-tailed catfish you could be growing a few different types of catfish so it's something i want to explore see if i can do it and then i'll, I'll get back to you if i can yeah. grow any fish <laughs> so do you think there's a market here in Australia to be able to sell that produce on and make an income from it? Yeah, yeah. I think yabbies for sure. Like the, the, how expensive lobsters are, they're, they're for sure. If we can grow freshwater, freshwater yabbies can get pretty large. You can get quite yep. large ones. And they can get large in two to three years. And it's, that's quite fast for something that on the market, a whole lobster, I, I'm not sure, I can't remember what it sells for in Australia, but it's not cheap. Yeah. But I, I remember... We um we rode to the top of Australia to Cape York on the motorbikes. Yeah. And um we got on a, a boat and we went over to an island and um anyway, we, we had lunch and the crab was the cheapest thing on the menu. And uh we were also like, Why is the crab the cheapest thing on the menu? And anyway, one of the guys said, I'm gonna order it. I love crab. And I'm like, it's too much hard work, you know. Mm. Anyway, the chef literally just walked straight out the bar, straight across the road, picked up the crab trap, put the crab out, brought it back and cooked it. <laughs> So it was the cheapest because it was no cost of goods. Yeah. It's just to get there, like less transportation, you know, like, yeah. I mean, it was like, mate, this is a long time ago, but it was like 18 bucks where a burger on the menu was 40, you know, yeah. uh, it was like, why is the crab so cheap? And we were like, that's why the crab's so cheap. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, and so with, with, with the abbeys, even, even if they weren't valued as much as lobster, even if they were considered a second price item, they were like poor man's lobster or something like that. Yeah. You're still going to get good money because there's the amount of yabbies that would grow inside your system. But I, I think this is my understanding of the direction. A lot of 
um, cuisine in Australia is headed, people are getting very excited about native foods. Yeah. And if you can grow a native lob, a native lobster, a native yabby, freshwater yabby, yeah. I think people would go nuts for it. And I think it would yeah. be worth more than saltwater lobster. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. As a kid growing up, um, yeah, one of my best friends, his dad was a crayfish farmer in the north in Port Macquarie. So yeah. yeah, they grew a lot of crayfish there. And it was my first experience of ever eating a, a brain of an animal was a crayfish brain. So you know. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting. <laughs> Tasted yeah. good until I knew what it was. <laughs> my first experience eating a brain was a sheep. Right, yeah okay right. yeah yeah so no it, it's interesting it, it's, it's funny how like you know it tastes good until you, until you know what it, to know what it is you know <laughs> for me I, I i give you i i grew up vegetarian never ate yep. meat until i was like 20 and then i started eating meat because i was living with jeff and nadia we were killing our own animals and um that that put me on the path of starting to eat eat meat but the whole thing, like from the beginning of me eating meat, I would eat the whole animal. I'd eat every part of it that I could. So my, yep. my, my understanding of eating meat, I've got no preference over flesh or organ. And yep. in the Middle East, very much the same. My yep. a Lebanese guy took me to, when I was in Egypt, he took me to a re, an organ restaurant, which is a thing in the Middle East. They've got organ restaurants where they specialize in organs. They serve the brain, the heart, the liver, intestines everything interesting um, so he took me to this organ restaurant because he thought it was going to really gross me out and <laughs> I, <laughs> I thought it was great yeah my favorite dish was easily in egypt though pigeon i really liked pigeon yeah okay yeah. Yeah. interesting yeah because a lot of people do grow pigeons yeah to consume so yeah well that that's why we've got pigeons in every city is yeah. originally that city was settled with pigeons for eating that's why the pigeons yeah. are there they yeah. would like sydney wouldn't have pigeons in it if the english settlers hadn't come over with pigeons to eat yeah. so genetically most of us are big part pigeon yep <laughs> no totally totally so i oh, mean well, tell us a bit more so um you should hear more about the course so what, what's yeah, tell us a bit more this course, how it works, and if people want to learn more about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, I, this course is it's the course I'm actually most excited about that I've ever given, that I've ever put out there. This course, the reason I've done it, the reason I put it together, is I teach lots of people how to design. So I, te I give people PDCs. In Jordan, what we're doing right now is we're giving people a permaculture design certificate course. And this course teaches people the foundations of designing regeneratively, designing as um, part of an ecosystem and as an individual that increases the resources of planet Earth, so being a benefit to the Earth. And people leave this course very inspired, very excited, but what do I do next? What do I yeah. do? Where do I get my skills to do this? If I go onto a piece of land now, I don't have the experience, I don't have the knowledge, what do I do? And so these practical courses, the reason I'm, I'm wanting to heavily focus on them is so that people can come and gain the experience in setting it up. So the way I've set up this practical course is I want to give people the majority of the experience in a condensed period that they would need to set up a site. Yeah. So I want them to come, I want them to direct machinery Jeff Lawton's son, Daniel Lawton, who's a permaculture earth mover. He's been doing permaculture since he was born. He's a born and bred permie. He is going to be driving the machine and people coming to the course, the students, are going to be directing him. So they're going to be helping him, showing, showing him the level, marking things out, those sorts of things, so that they know how to work with an earth mover. And they've been given a massive privilege working with such a good earth mover, an earth mover that actually understands the whole, the whole system. And then to follow up those earthworks, we're going to plant everything out with two of the best agroforesters I know. Um, Banya from the Northern Rivers has the largest botanical diversity of edible plants that I'm aware of in the Northern Rivers. He has an incredible knowledge um, working in the subtropics. So we'll dive in with him. And then we're flying a guy all the way from the US just to be there, flying him from Florida. And he's a subtropical permaculturalist as well, specializing in on agroforestry. He's able to put huge systems together. He's worked on massive farms. 
He's worked on, on um, conversions of olives, date palms, um, mangoes, bananas, um, 200 hectares, 500 hectares, like whole conversions. And he's coming over to, to share some of his specialist knowledge, getting in all our, our food forest system in together and our swale. And yeah. paired with that, we'll finish off with some with some playing in the water because it'll probably be pretty hot. So we'll be putting that <laughs> January. Like sort of fish working, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I've got a surprise going in at the, at the training center out there, which everyone will appreciate for the heat, so, uh, which would be good. Yeah. So, um exciting so yeah okay cool okay so yeah so anyone that's interested in doing the course we'll put the links in the description below and so it's going to be in january um january 1st yeah. is the first day first day exciting. of the january 1st we're kicking off the year with something good making sure that it starts regeneratively and gets rolling yeah yep. so yeah i think for me it was one of the after i did one of my pdcs like i i literally went crazy i did a few designs and then i went to replace my mum's place and it, I was actually at my mum's at Christmas time. I planted this little mini food forest mm. and no one's looked after it. No one's touched it. I made some little mini swales because literally just the way the mum, mum drops a grey water at the back of a place and it just ends up over in this little corner. And it's great. It's also the swales are still there. It still holds water. All the fruit trees are still there and no one's given yes. any love. You know, there's been no chop and drop and nothing. It's just like yeah. been left for you know, over a decade now. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's important to see systems still rolling afterwards. Yep. So, yeah. um, but I think yeah, that going and getting that practical experience and you know, like hands on, like it really just I don't know, supposed to it just really sunk in, you know, and yeah, yeah, all those learnings of because it's pretty fun that what you take in in your brain in a permaculture design course in ten days is a lot of information. Yeah. And uh, so I suppose the other thing I loved about doing my PDC at uh, at the farm, like you know, me and a lot of the students, the first thing in the morning were up or in the main crop garden down there doing things and playing around and you get to see a fully operational system and it's sort of like oh yeah i can see how that works and that works integrates with that you know you get to see that real picture uh, mm -hmm. i just think it's what's so powerful to be able to come to one of those workshops and and with what you're doing like get the hands-on experience to actually do that design and implement i think it's um yeah, it's a great way of learning and and really making it sticky that information you know yeah absolutely so, yeah and it's an experience that like if you haven't moved if you haven't directed heavy machinery before, it's intimidating as it's scary. Yep. And to have a situation where not only are you directing heavy machinery for your first time under guidance, but it's with people that really know what they're doing and you're able to yep. really get a sort of a handle on, on it to begin with, to just jump in, make huge mistakes for a lot of money is, is scary. I understand yep. that. And doing an environment like a course, there's nothing like it. It's, it's how I started doing earth moving. Yeah, I started doing it with Jeff. I started seeing how it was done, and then I could do it by myself. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think the value of watching someone that's learnt those mistakes, you know, um, yeah, yeah, you, you can't put a you know, you can't put a price on it, you know. So, but it's um, yeah, the amount of money you save and mistakes. I've seen so many bad designs on properties, and especially yeah. recently we looked at the communities, um, and just they've been really badly set up, you know. So, um, right, yeah. So it's, I, I, yeah. Share a quick story. One of one of the first designs I ever did. Uh, is, is, I was very very proud of it. Um, what well, there there was a guy. He had he had just bought a, a quite a large piece of land in in a in a flood zone, and he he had very steep cliffs, very steep sides, and he had a building. He had a house right up on the side of the cliff, right quite high up on the side, and he hadn't experienced the wet season yet. Yeah. And he was pouring all his money in, fixing this house, and he, he got me in to design the landscape and didn't expect me to have any insight on his house. He thought, you know, permaculture means farming, doesn't mean houses, doesn't mean energy, doesn't mean all these other things, it just means farming. And I came in, saw his house, and I was like, brother, I reckon you're pouring a lot of money into something that's going to cost you a lot of money. And he was already in a stage where he had a lot of tension with his wife. His wife yeah. wasn't sure. She was really scared about she wanted to live a really like in a really nice house if she was going to do it so he had to make sure that the house was perfect before she'd move in i said look i, I reckon what you should do because he had already zoned on his land he had dual occupancy on his land he wasn't taking advantage of it so i was like look sell this house sell it, it it's it's got an amazing view it'd be worth 1.5 million dollars make 1.5 million dollars Stay in the townhouse, 
keep keep living in the townhouse. Don't don't cost yourself your marriage, and build your next house. So I just within the first ten minutes of doing the design for him, I had saved his marriage and made him one point five million dollars. <laughs> was like, look, I reckon you know <laughs> whatever whatever other um, design stuff you're going to do. I reckon I've saved yep. you a bit of money here. I think, totally. I think I've done yeah, The rest is just a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It, it is so true of how, um, you know, like just simply, the, in special relationships, I think people don't put real value on that of having a professional there and of the headache that, yeah, of the cost of something goes wrong and redoing it, but this that emotional, you know, in a relationship Absolutely. headache that you can cause from a bad design. So yeah, definitely so. Cool. Like that with directing earthworks if you don't know what you're doing there's more at stake than your money and there's yep. more at stake than your time as well it is yep. so helpful to have someone who's walked the path before i'm not saying don't make your own mistakes i'm not saying don't do it yourself but leapfrog that save yourself money by attending a course you will save a lot of money attending a course don't no, don't totally. um yeah don't don't miss that opportunity yep no, that's it. So awesome. All right, mate. So is there anything else? So if if from this conversation, is there one thing you'd recommend someone go out and do, what would it be? After listening to this. If if you haven't done a permaculture design course, do a permaculture design course. It'll change the way you see the world. It'll completely change the way your mind functions. Um from there, the, the door opens really wide if you if you're willing to walk through it. I think they're they're for me, until I learned that design system, I, I knew I wanted to do this. I knew I, I liked this and this thing and that thing. And I already had the interest of all the topics of permaculture design before I did my PDC. I was already fascinated with all of it. And I, and I hear it a lot. It's like, wow, they just put my thoughts. They just put what I wanted to do or what I was thinking into a framework to understand. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I can study all the things I'm passionate about in one place. And for rather than struggling your whole life to find that roadmap, and that's what, what a lot of older guys, like my granddad's friends and stuff would say, they're like, oh, they, they're just doing stuff that we do anyway. It's like, yeah, but, but it's a body of like thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that have collated all this information and perfected these different methods and ways of doing it. Don't be too arrogant to miss out on that connection on on that that group of phenomenal people doing phenomenal things don't yeah. let that pass you by so i think engaging in these courses engaging in that community is going to give you a, a massive leg up into a, yeah. into a professional world of regeneration no totally awesome mate thank you and uh appreciate your time yeah and uh we'll put all sam's details in below everybody reach out and have a chat with him there good to see you mate, yeah, mate. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found the content educational and inspiring. If you got something out of it and you think you know someone else that would actually also enjoy it, we'd really appreciate if you could share the link with them and encourage them to check out our channel. And don't forget you can join the Off Grid Tribe podcast for free. We can actually ask and interact with myself and also our guest speakers. So jump over today to the offgridtribe.com, register yourself an account. We can actually have a conversation with myself and one of our guest speakers and we can continue the conversation there. Together, let's embrace the power of sustainable living.